Hey, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another epic book review. Another epic book review. And I've actually been getting some good feedback on these. And I started doing these book reviews. So I started doing these book reviews as a way for me to really lock in the ideas that I pick up from these books to connect and really resonate with my own thinking. And I started by really spending a lot of time just with physical books, taking about 10, 15, 20 to 30 minutes on my mood. I kind of set a goal of reading at least 30 minutes each time. And what I started to do is venture into some more audible books only when I'm running though, not when I'm doing work, not when I'm doing email, not when I'm distracted by other things. Basically when I do the lowest level thinking of putting my foot, one foot in front of the other, then I can do the book reviews. And I had mentioned that I started to just, I wasn't really into audible. So I just downloaded all the credits I had and just picked some books up and they're just random books. And I don't know why I picked them. And the book that I'm going to review today is one of those books and it is the art of racing in the rain. And before I get into it, I'm gonna really encourage you, I've committed to this year, I'm gonna encourage you to give this video on YouTube and if you could subscribe to the channel, that's really helpful in me helping grow and share some of this learning with others. And I try to make this podcast not about telling people what to do. I find, find that a little bit insufferable on social media, but just sharing my learning and hoping someone can glean some insights from that. And the art of racing in the rain is probably the reason I picked up the book is there's a dog on the cover. I, I knew there was a movie out. I saw a dog on the cover. I'm a huge dog fan. So here's a, something I want you to comment. If you're on YouTube right now, I encourage you to comment, what is your favorite dog book or movie and why did you love it so much? I'd love to hear it. I can say probably my favorite dog movie ever is My Dog Skip. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. I absolutely love that. Malcolm in the Middle kid is in that. And it is one of my favorites. So if you can actually just comment down below, what is your favorite dog movie of all time? And you think well, this is probably my first fiction book I've ever done one of these epic book reviews. So I actually, I, I was just trying to read for joy, but there's always great lessons that you can pick up. If you're really passionate about whatever field you're in, whatever you're doing, I feel there's some really cool lessons you can learn personally and professionally from any book you read, whether it's a fiction or nonfiction book. If you're observant, it's one of the characteristics of the innovator's mindset. It's actually looking outside of the things that you do and picking up ideas to bring them back. And so I'll share some of those ideas with you in a little bit, but I do want to talk a little bit about this book and why it resonated with me so much in the first part, first place. I'll give you a synopsis in a second, but it is actually a story told about a man and his dog from the viewpoint of the dog. And the dog is telling the story and it immediately brought me to tears because I was really thinking about my own dogs and especially my dog. Odom is probably about 14, 15 years old. I got him when he was six months old from the Humane Society. And I cannot tell you, I cannot stress enough, that dog has saved my life so many times. And really thinking about what he has seen from me, my life changes, Things have happened and it grow. And so it was really a sentimental thing to think like, what does he see? What does he know through my life journeys? He's moved with me to, I think, five different houses. He's been by my side and he's getting older. And one of the things I know I've mentioned, a lot of people that listen to podcasts that we moved to Florida in the last year. One of the best things that about this move, and I understand why people retire when they move here, is Odom has diabetes and really... You, I have to give him insulin every day, t twice a day. And he, when we moved here, he was struggling. He was having some issues. And part of the issues that he was having was he was looking drunk at some points where he was falling over. He couldn't balance himself. And I was getting really nervous. And I thought it was the heat. But the reality of it was, I guess it was part of the heat. When we moved here, his actually, his diabetes got better. And so I was over give, giving him too much insulin based on living in Edmonton. So I've actually lowered his dose of insulin. And not only that, his joints are better, he's walking better. And it's just really amazing to see that. And dogs are part just with us for a short time. 
in our lives, but for their entire lives. And yeah, I, it just, this he, hearing the story and really thinking about the empathy and understanding, and there's some witty parts from it that really resonate with me as someone who's had dogs literally the first day I became a teacher. I promised myself when I was a kid, because I always wanted my, a dog, my parents would never let me get one, that the second I become an adult, I felt that was the day I signed my first teacher contract, I would get a dog. I actually signed my teacher contract and uh, went straight to the SBCA and I actually got a dog from there and I named him Kobe. And he was there with me until I became a principal. And when he died, it would really stuck with me. Actually, I have like my last moments with him on video. And I watch him every now and then because he made a huge impact on me. And if you're not a dog person, you might not be understanding all this stuff, but it was really, I felt that he really helped me grow because it was the first rush with death that I ever had. And, and I remember like just being in a depression and really struggling and a friend of mine about a month after, cause I was not seeming to get out of it. I was really struggling with it. He said, I know you lost a dog and how hard that is, but you're not replacing a dog. You're giving another dog a home that really needs a great owner and needs a good home. So maybe there's another dog out there for you that you could actually give a home to. And he gave me that courage. I remember I went with my brother Alec and, and I saw Odom and love at first sight. And he was home with me the next day. And I just feel like I, I don't know if I would have got out of that depression, that moment without him and just dealing with some of the negatives that have happened in my life and Odom being there. And he just seems to know. And it's like when I was reading this or listening to this book, the dog kind of seems to know when he needs to be in the room, when he needs to be closest to the the people he's caring for and I just I thought it was a really great book so it, it resonated with me on a very personal level but there are some educational lessons I picked up from this as well and I'm going to read you a, a quote first that I thought it was a really great kind of synopsis of the whole book and then I'm going to read you a summary that I asked chat GPT to write um, just to see how that would look and so the quote that really resonated with me is this one that which we manifest is before us we are the creators of our own destiny be it through intention or ignorance, our successes and our failures have been brought on by none other than ourselves. This is from Garth Stein, obviously, who wrote the book, or could be from Enzo the dog. It depends on how you look at it. That is actually read in, in, Enzo's, in Enzo's voice. And I, I really think about that quote, and a lot of people, they would get bothered by this because they're saying, this person did this horrible thing to me. Yeah, and people have done horrible things to people for all of times. And it's not discounting that, disregarding that, but it's never anybody else's responsibility to help you move forward, to help you get better. And this idea of like that other people are just absolved of responsibility, it's not that at all, but they are not necessarily responsible for you moving forward. And I think sometimes some of the worst situations that I can see in my life, I had to figure out a way forward because if I didn't, no one else was going to do it for me. And, and some of the things that have happened to me that I saw as extremely negative at the time, also, when I look back, really helped me to grow, to get better, to move forward. And I don't think everything that happens in your life needs to be a learning lesson for you to grow. But I do think there are just things that help us to get better, to help us move forward. And maybe, hey, always thinking about what did I do wrong in the situation? What did I do that I could get better? Because that's all I can do moving forward is to ensure that I grow no matter what happened to me. And so I th think I really like that quote and I'll get into some more quotes and why they resonate with me, but I'll give you the synopsis as shared by Chad GPT. And it's this one. The art of racing the rain is a heartwarming novel that tells the story of a race car driver and his beloved dog. Enzo, who narrates the story, shares his unique perspective on life, love, and the human condition. The book explores themes of family, friendship, and the bonds that connect us all. Written by Garth Stein, the novel is a moving and thought-provoking read that will leave you with a newfound appreciation for the power of the human-animal bond. A must-read for anyone who loves dogs, racing, and a good tearjerker story. That was pretty much what the book is about. Now, in the epic book review, what I'm not going to do is tell you the ending, give away any of the story. Uh, it's something that, especially if you love dogs, you'll enjoy this book. But I am going to talk about three quotes that resonate with me and make my own connections to them. And so I'll start with these quotes. And the first one is this one. People are always worried about what's happening next. 
They often find it difficult to stand still, to occupy the now without worrying about the future. People are generally not satisfied with what they have. They are very concerned with what they're going to have. And boy, did I love that quote. That one really stuck out with me. And it's way more powerful when it's said by a dog. But I was thinking about how does that quote connect to my own life and maybe some of my own experience. And I'll give you an example. When I became assistant principal early on in my career, I'll tell you this, that I actually never wanted to go into administration. And then just a series of events led me to applying for a job. And surprisingly, I got that job. And on my very first day of assistant principal, not I was like not sure if this was something I loved. And then probably on my second day, I'm like, I'm, I want to be a principal one day. Like, I love this job, but I want to be a principal one day. And the thing was that I had such a great mentor. His name is Archie Lilico. And he was ready to ensure that I would be a principal someday. So he never treated me as like a secondary. He treated me as someone who was, he was mentoring to get to that spot. And yeah, of course I had to do assistant principal duties, things that he assigned to me and other things that I gravitated towards to get done. He gave me such freedom to really try to help move the school forward in a way that best suited my strengths and, and, and things I could bring to the table. But he knew I wanted to be a principal and he mentored me really well. And so probably within a year or so, I actually was offered a principalship, but it was in a place that I didn't necessarily know if I wanted to go. And I, I had just, I want to be a principal. I want to be a principal. I want to be a principal. And I know I was doing really well as an assistant principal at that time and making sure Archie was very happy. The school community with me was very happy, but my sights were so set on becoming a principal. And when I looked at the job was something I wanted, but not in a place that I wanted to go at that point in my life. It was very far away from the city. I was on my own at the time and I had a routine that I had developed in the city that would be totally destroyed if I took this job. So I, had, I struggled and I remember talking to Archie and saying like, I was struggling, but if I don't take this job, will I ever get the opportunity again? And he said to me, so tell me the worst case scenario if you choose not to have this job. And I said, well, I'll still be here as assistant principal. And he's like, and how do you like being assistant principal? I'm like, I love it. And then he said, why do you love it? And I said, well, I love the community. I love the job. I love working with you, obviously. And so he said, so the, basically the worst thing that can happen is you're in a place that you're really happy and you don't get a job. And you might have to wait a little bit longer for another job. And it might never happen, but you can still be in a place that you really enjoy. So maybe you need to focus on the things that you have and not what you don't have. And it really brought me some perspective because I was so envisioning something else. And I, I said no to the job and thought that was it for me. I was never going to get a job. And what I did was not focus on being a principal anymore. I focused on being the best at what I was doing at that point. And I did that. And then eventually the job came to me. And sometimes when we're so focused on the future, we actually lose out on the present and doing our best. But if you focus really well on the present, what happens is we actually open up doors to the future. And I think that to me was a really important message. And that's why I really loved that quote and it resonated with me. The next one, there is no dishonor in losing the race. There is only dishonor in not racing because you are afraid to lose. And I love that quote. And I have some good friends, people that are very close to me. And when I talk to them, they have these wonderful ideas. And I was just actually having a conversation with a group recently. And we were talking about the difference between creativity and innovation. I said, creativity is more something that sticks in your mind where innovation is acting upon it, is actually doing something with that creative tendency and creating something as we move forward. And there are so many people that I've connected with that have these brilliant ideas but are so scared to actually move forward. And their focus is what could go wrong? What will happen if I don't, if it doesn't go out the way I planned? And I can say this, and maybe it's just a little bit of, I'm not the brightest guy in the world. When I get an idea in my head, I just move forward. When I start these epic book reviews, I actually, just said one day, you know what? I'm reading these books. Why don't I actually start sharing them with the world? And I started doing them. And now it's just a thing I do. I never gave myself doubt or anything. What I started focusing on wasn't what could go wrong. It was what could go right. And I knew that if I actually started doing these book reviews, the ideas from the books, because I shared them with you, will stick in my head and they'll become 
just expand my knowledge, expand the things that I understand and how I look at the world. And so when you are thinking about something really creative, don't overthink it. I think that's where we get into trouble. When we put all these, this could go wrong. What about this? What about this? I talk about starting this podcast. I started with a little mic. I plugged in my phone and I would sit in a dark room in a chair and record it. And if I would have just thought about all of the stuff that I needed to put this together, the cameras, the video, the audio, the mics, all this other stuff, I would have never got to it. I just said, let's just go and see how it goes. And then if I get better at it, then I'll start buying the other stuff. Then I'll start putting stuff together. And so that, and it's still going to grow. It's still going to get better. There's things I still want to do in this podcast that look different. Thought about having a studio, doing some in-person podcast recordings. But that's, that's something I just want to enjoy this right now and get better at this and see how this grows. So don't focus on what could go wrong. Focus on what could go right. And if you do that, things start to happen really quick. The last quote, this really resonated with me. That which is around me does not affect my mood. My mood affects that which is around me. And I love this quote. And I was thinking about this quote because it actually says a lot about how we enter a room, how we enter a space. And think about an education the notorious staff room. And I'm sure if you've been in education for at least five years, you've been in staff rooms that give you energy and you've been in staff rooms that deplete you. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is those staff rooms deplete you is to get in there and get into a negative spiral or just not even go into those spaces. I remember early on in my career, the staff room had some negativity to it and I just stayed in my room for lunch. But I started focusing more as I grew my career, grew confidence that I can really actually affect the mood of the staff room that maybe it is negative, but it, what can I bring to the table to shift that? And a lot of times we are, we can easily, we will morph to the people around us, but we can also help people. If that's true, then we can also be the influence on others as well. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this. That basically, and it, when you think about this again, I'll read the quote again. That which is around me does not affect my mood. My mood affects that which is around me. That not only do you affect the people around you, but the way you affect them affects other people. If you go on social media, Twitter, and stuff like that, there's a lot of negativity. And what happens, that negativity starts to actually really brew. And then what happens, that negativity goes into schools, goes into classrooms. And the same can be true when, and I'm not saying positivity, this toxic positivity stuff that people talk about. And I get toxic positivity is a thing and I always give this analogy. Toxic positivity is like when your house is burning down and you're standing in the middle of it and say, mm, it's nice and warm in here. That's toxic positivity. But really the focus on positivity is saying, hey, the house is burning down. We need to figure something out. It's finding a way for it, finding a solution for it. And that to me is really how do we affect um, the things around us and make them better. And I remember there was this young lady who worked at McDonald's. And this is something I, I always think about. I never talk about enough. This young lady worked at McDonald's and I would actually go there in the morning before work. And she was just the most positive, uplifting person ever. She, it was like every time I ordered a sausage and egg McMuffin, she was like a motivational speech was waiting for me at that window. And she just made you feel so special and welcome. And just the way it wasn't, that's just how she took your orders. She'd always ask you about you. And it, I just remember that and remember just having great conversations with her, even for that brief amount of time, because you knew that people were behind and waiting. And then I just think about how she, her tone actually changed, often changed my tone. And then when my tone changed, what happened? I go into a school and I'm in a better mood. And then my mood is affecting people around them. And then what happens with them? Their mood is affecting the kids they're working with, the people they work with in that day. And I don't know if that, I think about that a lot. I don't know what was going on in her life. I don't know a lot of stuff, but I always knew when I saw her, she was going to lift me up. And think about this. When you walk into a room, are you a fountain or a drain? Do you actually give people energy or you suck it out of the room. And because it doesn't just matter what happens in that room, what happens when people leave the room, how they feel when they leave the room, does it actually make the world better? I think that's something I really think about. And that's why that quote really stuck out with me. 
And so those three quotes I want to share with you because they really resonated. Now, I really like this book. It's a dog book. There's some parts, I'm going to be honest with you, are a little like, oh, this is like a little weird. And it didn't resonate with me. I'm more of a nonfiction, but I want to try this with my run. It's a shorter book. I, this is actually probably the first book that I've ever read that I know there's a movie out and I didn't watch the movie first. And I'm even talking like high school. And so if you're a dog lover, you'll appreciate this book. But I find there's just so many little good messages that remind us of the impact that we can have on the world, the impact that we can have on ourselves. So I would suggest it if you're, especially if you're a dog person. But as I asked you earlier, I would love, I love dog stories. What is your favorite dog movie? What's your favorite dog book? I'd love to hear about them in the comments down below. But thanks for being here for another epic book review. I, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for all you do. Take care. Bye-bye.